as mere humans, it is becoming very difficult for us to tell what is actual reality and what has been created by artificial intelligence. Shutter Stories, a canon podcast. Hi, I'm Ilvin Jokicin, a photojournalist and Canon ambassador, and welcome to the latest episode of Shutter Stories, a Canon podcast. From the dawn of the daguerreotype to the era of mirrorless technology, the imaging landscape has continually evolved, driven by technological advancements that have reshaped how we capture and tell stories. In fact, we could be living through another leap in imaging technology right now, driven by AI. What lies beyond the current viewfinder? What innovations await us in the next chapter of visual storytelling? What impact will they have on the creative process and the consumer experience? Joining me to discuss these fascinating topics and share their views are Alessia Glaviano, head of Global Photovogue and director of the Photovogue Festival, and David McClelland, technology expert, journalist, and podcaster. Welcome to you both. Hi. 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 Thank you so much for making the time. I'm very excited about this very specific uh, episode on XR. Before we get into all of that, uh, would you please briefly introduce yourselves? Um, and let's start with you, Alessia. Hi, I'm Alessia Glaviano. I'm uh, the head of Global Photo Vogue and director of Photo Vogue Festival. And I've been uh, in the business of photography for, I guess, the past 30 years. Wow, nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being here. And David? Uh, hello, I'm a technology journalist. I've been writing and talking about technology, sometimes about cameras and photography as well. And I'm a, I, I'm a podcaster. I, I just love living in this part of the where, where creativity and technology kind of intersect. Well, I'm very excited to be speaking to both of you. And David, I think we're going to start with you because... I think you, as a technology expert, would be the perfect person to explain to all the listeners what XR, AI, uh, AR, VR uh, are. <laughs> what are we going to be talking about today? Of course. So we live in a world of alternative realities. And this this term, or, or these terms, AR, VR, they're short for things like augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. But they all seem to be grouped together under this term XR and the X could stand for extended reality, but really it, it's just a letter that can be replaced by something else. And the key difference really between them is in VR or virtual reality, when you are wearing one of these head mounted displays, these funny headsets that look like IMAX ski goggles, you are fully immersed in a virtual space. That space doesn't necessarily exist. You are certainly not present in the space in which you are wearing that. That is a virtual reality. And then you start taking steps back to actual reality. So for example, augmented reality is when you're wearing one of these headsets, but you are in the space. You might be sitting in your living room and you've got the TV in front of you and there's a sofa and there's a dining table over there. But augmented on top of that is virtual information. So it might be uh, a phone call that's coming into you. It might be the weather. It might be a social media feed. So your actual reality is being augmented by digital information that's being fed in through other sources. And then variations on that mixed reality, for example, is where uh, you will have on the table in front of you, your display, your head mounted display is aware of that table and it might try to put in that 3D space an object on that table that you can interact with. So I'm a photojournalist myself and uh, we are in one way, uh, I think many of us, I'm not just talking about photojournalists, but embracing all these beautiful new technologies, right? Uh, but I'm also curious, and that's also a question to you, David, um, the the AI, AR, VR, let's just call it XR in this, uh, in this podcast, um, is really changing what we make and how we make it. Can you maybe explain about that, like more the details of that? And also, and that is a thing that I'm seeing more in photojournalism, is how consumers or sometimes makers are really wanting real and genuine content instead. So I think what we need to do here is to split out the 
AI piece, the artificial intelligence piece from the XR. Artificial intelligence is uh, obviously a thing, particularly generative AI over the last, I guess, since about November or so 2022, when a company called OpenAI released on the world this thing called ChatGPT. And we also started to see other engines as well that generate things that don't exist. Uh, now, these can create lifelike, not only words, but pictures, images, and also now, as we've seen more recently, video as well. And I think a real difference is that as, as mere humans, it is becoming very difficult for us to tell what is actual reality and what has been created by artificial intelligence. Seeing is no longer believing. And that poses uh, some real existential questions, not only for those who are creating these works for creatives, whether you are a photographer or a videographer or you work in photojournalism, but also for those of us on the receiving end of these as well. As a human, for at least the 40 odd years of my existence, if I see something that looks like video, I have, I guess I've learned to sort of trust it. Whereas now, over the last 18 or so months, that is certainly something that we can no longer take for granted. So the whole contract between consumers and those creating content has fundamentally changed with the introduction of these generative AI technologies. Yeah. Yeah, totally. No, I I know the feeling when you're scrolling through the internet and thinking, is this real or is it not? Alessia, how has this XR uh, been part of your industry? Well, first of all, I would like to give a personal opinion, which is that I am, uh, I mean, I think that the ethical question that this raises are paramount Mm -hmm. And it should be taken into consideration, especially you that are a photojournalist. I mean, <laughs> yes. I did like that David was making, you know, a distinction between uh, generative AI. So the idea to making something from scratch, that mm -hmm. would be images, text, whatever, videos, blah, blah, blah. And a difference with what could be the exper experiencing images and videos and stuff. So... You know, we really have to um, make these distinctions. And uh, I do have friends like Fred Ricin or uh, Santiago mm -hmm. Leon, you know, who are yes. uh, trying to work really hard to create uh, um, a scenario where uh, um, we can uh, we can limit the damages of uh, uh, what this generative AI is doing uh, in general to to the truth, to the news, to the mm -hmm. news, you know. I mean, we it's been ages now, years, that there is already, you know, not that big faith into what we see, what we read, and, and this creates even, a, even, you know, a larger problem. I don't know, like yesterday, I don't know if you've seen those images of Trump yes. in a crowd of black uh, people and that were made... Uh, you know, to embrace somehow um, black people before the elections. I mean, this is so, so, so dangerous. I feel that, uh, uh, and, you know, I dedicated the last edition of the festival that I directed, the Photovogue Festival, to AI. Mm -hmm. Not because I think everything is great about AI, but because I always try to engage with the issues that I feel are relevant in the, in the time being. Yes. Okay, so... I thought we needed to talk about AI and I did a, a, a three-day um, symposium on AI and a lot of very interesting people came and, and, and gave their presentations and, and, you know, I think we should make a distinction between arts and entertainment and then uh, instead news and photojournalism, you know, of course. Now, the problem is, and then stop me if I'm going too far. The, the problem is that I feel um, it's very difficult to say, okay, then, you know, this is interesting. If you use it in for just for the arts, you can experiment, blah, blah, blah. But no, don't use it for the news. I mean, once it's out there, yeah. if you it are not moved by the right uh, reasons, it's a problem. And we have a very strict... Uh, Con, uh, rules in Condé Nast, I'm talking about Condé Nast worldwide at the moment, 
to protect copyrights, to protect, mm -hmm. you know, a, a real artist, I mean, work done by artists. Um, so we do not use AI. We've done it. We've done some experiments that were in the beginning, but just really to to see, you know, and to talk about the issue. But uh, we're not, uh, we're trying to prevent that. Actually. Can I jump in there? On this point, on this point about journalism and generative AI clashing. We see a lot of examples of this already. And I can speak for news media in the UK to a certain extent. And we've seen many publishers, many media owners already experimenting, certainly in the written form with using generative AI, whereby journalists are essentially becoming editors. They are editing the, uh, the, the output. However, from a visual point of view, a uh, an AI news service broke cover towards the end of last year, Channel One AI, uh, which is broadcast, will will be broadcast, uh, although the first uh, peaks of it have, have already become available, by uh, virtual news hosts. It is not, it, wow. it is unashamedly an AI generated news service. And it is, it is interesting. It is personalised news. Uh, your your handful of news anchors do not exist, but they look so real. <sighs> they can talk in Crazy. any language. The lips move. It is uh, it's a real existential question again. And that existential word, I know we're talking about XR and all of that sort of stuff. The big X for me is existential, frankly, around all of this generative stuff. But when we start to see outliers start to use generative AI to create broadcast news. We're already seeing news outlets, frankly, because they're being squeezed by lack of advertising revenue and the fact that the internet is the internet and that is their income. Mm -hmm. It is inevitable that there will become more and more of an overlap, which again, I think places us as consumers, as a civilization, really, in a, in a very difficult place. And on the subject of elections, this year, 2024, about half of the world's population is going to vote in, uh, as part of democracy. And that poses a real question for whether democracy is strong enough, whether our societies are strong enough to stand up to generative AI, because you can bet your bottom dollar when a candidate who's got some funding is uh, losing in the polls, they're going to deploy whatever dark arts they have available to them as frankly we've seen in other election campaigns through social media in order to pull themselves further up the polls. Um, and it's really worrying. It's a, it's a lack of truth. It's a lack of trust in, in these technologies. And also the concentration of power as well. The fact that these generative AI systems it's only big tech, really, that has the resources to create them. It's not distributed. You know, we, we can't easily uh, have our own generative AI systems. Yeah. We can all use them, but we can't have our own. So when we start to get concerned about things like bias, like lack of truth, then really it's just a handful of centers of power that are controlling this generative AI powered future. And it's really concerning. It's really concerning uh, to not even go into the pollution of all this because I don't think it's been uh, talk. I, I don't think we talk uh, uh, enough about how how much pollution and and how how bad it is for the environment. All of this uh, use of AI and and the energy that it needs, you know. So this is another point that we should be stressing and. Uh, uh, and talk about to the point to what we were saying, David, we are seeing also, you know, model agencies that are with all models that are not real models, you know, so it's like, okay. And then, you know, I, I, I just, what's happening? How did we get so far? <laughs> well, I'm curious now about uh, when you organized the Photofolk Festival and it was all about AI. I'm curious, did the conversations become heated at some moments? Of course, no, <laughs> they were heated, definitely. You know, I mean, I think it's important to listen to everyone's voice and reasons when they are experts in the fields. So, you know, I dedicated two days to issues related to photojournalism and truth. And uh, I had really uh, all the you can you can watch the, the the thing is all free and online for everyone this symposium. So, um, 
and then one day to fo- to fashion and arts because again I feel that we should make a difference. You know, I think that there are some artists who are experimenting with AI and are producing really interesting work. Okay. Um, but you know, in the arts, you don't have to adhere to reality. I mean, it's like, you know, we're not talking about journalism. The, the thing is that the medium of photography, the medium of video as, as the medium of writing is used to, to do different things, right? Yes. So absolutely. I could be writing what I need to go and buy at the grocery stores, or I could be writing an essay or a, a poetry, right? Same thing, photography and video. It could be an art piece. It could be, or it's a documentary work. So we ought to make a difference and we have to treat these things differently. Then, for instance, uh, to contradict myself, um, I feel that there are also interesting projects that are, uh, let's say, done with the purpose of uh, informing. So we could talk about mm, news in this case, documentary projects, um, where the use of AI could be interesting. Uh, and it is when... Uh, um, when you have situation that you cannot photograph, like for instance, um, showing the damages to the environment in the future, we can't photograph the future. So maybe AI, if could be interesting. I'm just smiling because that's a topic I'm working on, ah. and I've been struggling and struggling and struggling my way through my new project, and then. I was at a festival recently and someone said, maybe you should include AI. And all of a sudden my brain went like, oh, yeah, maybe I should. Yeah, why not? I mean, it's interesting. Let's see what happened. And of course, you know, you you should say it and be transparent about it. And then, for instance, at the festival, there's this very interesting project that I, I, I really suggest that you all go see if you don't know it. It's called Exhibit AI. Mm-hmm. And um, they have a website. It's um, a, a, a studio of lawyer. Uh, I don't know how you say it in English. Uh, in, in in Australia, and uh, they did this collaborative project with uh, uh, refugees, and it's so 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 interesting because you know um, these refugees. Uh, in these centers where where they're detained, they couldn't go journalists and take pictures, right? Yeah. So to show to the people what they've been through, uh, this studio, they made this collaborative project where, you know, technicians would work together with the victims and uh, and generate images. Everything is, of course, transparent. The, so I think that is very a very noble use, right, in this case of AI. But again, of course, there are all these noble uses, but are they, uh, let's say, the good things enough to allow, I mean, it's not that we can say we don't allow because it's happening, it's happening. It's like, how do you... can't stop this machine, I think. No, but at least I think we should be really, really mindful and not just uh, embracing everything that arrives and just say... Because I don't think that... uh, I don't think that progress is necessarily a good... always a good thing, Ah. you know? I don't know. In which sense? From a philosophical point of view. Yeah, yeah, that, that things don't always have to change, you mean? No, I'm saying that sometimes uh, improvements could be not a good thing. You know, it's not that always, you know, there there are there is this thing that we should all be always enthusiastic about youth, enthusiastic about new things, enthusiastic. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's see. No? Yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. And, mm. Well, actually, to be honest, this is the first kind of technology that I've, I'm nearly 40. I think this is the first thing that I have seen happen uh, where it kind of scares me. The first one out of all these, I mean, uh, uh, things that appeared. It should scare us all. David, there's one thing I don't know if you know about this that I wanted to ask you. I mean, I remember listening to some podcasts where... Uh, like very clever scientists were saying, you know, that machine could took over. I mean, is that like something that you 
see as something that could happen or is wow. it? Just the big questions there. Yeah, just <laughs> dropping it like I that. Think, I think may, maybe what you're referring to there is what's often called the, the AI singularity. Exactly. Yeah. And this is the point in time at some undeterminate point in the future that may never happen, let's see, that AI becomes uh, self, I, I guess it, it can now elbow humans out the way. It is self-sustaining. It uh, sees that uh, someone's asked it, asked it a question, how do you ensure the survival of the planet Earth? And its response is to, well, humans aren't ready helping. Yeah. And so, yeah, that is a that is scary. And I think one of the things that we've learned over the last 18 months of this current wave, and AI is certainly not a new term, and AI is an umbrella term for lots of different things. And we've been using AI in, in that broader sense for years, years in our in our cameras, in our phones, and on our computers. But certainly it's gained a lot of uh, public momentum over the last 18 months. And we don't really know what's next. I think that with many of the technology revolutions over the last, uh, certainly our adult lifetimes, the last 20 or so years, it's great. Well, there's now a search engine and yes, there's now a mobile phone. You know, they've been interesting and change game changing to a certain extent, but not existential in the sense that what we're seeing, the current wave of AI. And I don't know that we know what is next. And as soon as fear, uncertainty, doubt creeps in, which is where we are right now, I think, then yes, we will start going clemic. We will start fearing the worst. Maybe maybe this will be a case of we will understand what the next set of limitations with AI are, and maybe things will go quiet for another few years, and then we will, as soon as the computing power, to your point, Alessia, as soon as the energy supply to feed these large AI systems can improve or, or can get larger. Um, it, it might be that we face the next revolution, the next evolution in, in four or five years time. But the fact is, we really don't know what path AI is taking us on right now. And that's a pretty scary for all of us, no matter what industry we're in. I know we're talking about the creative industries, the visual industries right now, but there are industries all over the place from the legal profession downwards and upwards that are concerned and scared. Yeah. Also, I think it's interesting from a neurological point of view, you know how actually technology, I feel it's always, is not something alien from us. It's something that it's part of us. It's been, you know, from the beginning of the of when we were, you know, everything is technology. You make a a, a tool to go and and feed your family. I mean, so technology it's us. It's not alien from us. It's part of us. And I think McLuhan was saying it's the one who was saying that we do not end where our physical body ends, but where technology can take us. And I do really believe in this, you know, AI is going to change our neurology. Um, do you feel that or will photographers kind of need to expand their skill set now already? Or kind of the feeling that I'm having, I would rather kind of wait and see? Or do we all need to jump in now before we kind of miss the boat? There's a big point around AI and jobs. And one of the fairly twee cliche sayings is that you won't be replaced by AI. You will be replaced by somebody who is using AI in their work. And I, I, I do think there's a lot of truth in that. And I'm already speaking with photographers who are using AI in its various guises as part of their creative workflows, not necessarily to replace the work that they're doing, but if it is um, just cleaning up an image, if it's grading an image, if it's just removing one or two bits or expanding it a little bit, if it's sorting through a shoot where you might have taken a thousand images and you just want the 35 selects that you're going to work on further, there are AI tools already that will help you to do that. Oh. And then, and then there are creative tools. And this is where artists, photographers are almost starting to refer to themselves in a different way when they are creating their work in this way. So there's one uh, artist, uh, photographer, and now promptographer is the word that they use to create their work, who has risen to prominence over the last uh, couple of years or so and, and won some awards. And uh, uh, they say, look, there is a real danger of confusing photography with 
promptography, the, the creation of virtual images or of, of uh, imaginary uh, of AI generated images through prompts. And I think that it's helpful for us to make that division in our head. There is certainly work there. I really enjoy the creative opportunities. I, I really enjoy some of the AI generated work that I have seen online. It's great, but I'm able in my head because I know where it's coming from to hopefully not get too confused and to be able to compartmentalize it in my in my head it's when i don't know it's when i don't trust but again that's go, going back to an earlier point maybe so now that prompts uh, in that kind of photography well i'm not sure if i should call it photography but art um that prompts are so important and i know they're quite difficult to to make dip, uh, like a really good prompt it's very it's not easy um so when you I wonder, are you then an artist or are you just a good writer? Oh, certainly the creators, the promptographers who I've spoken to will uh, are artists in my book. Uh, and this whole term prompt engineering is what we use when we're talking about how to uh, prompt a, a an, an AI, a generative AI to create something. And frankly, I think that, yes, you're absolutely right. The the terms, you, you look at some of the prompts that go into creating the images that, that we see, and they can be sometimes a hundred or so words long. You can specify the look, the era, the type of film, the type of grade, the elements that you want Want in or you don't want in. There is a real art in creating that. Uh, again, is that uh, is that the same type of artistry as a photographer would be employing? Perhaps not, but there is certainly an artistry in it. I think that in any case, you have to know your references. So, yes. which is the same that goes with an artist, right? So it's like the more you know about arts, about, you know, the more you're able to communicate that. So, yes, I do think, yes, it's different. But at the end, you see that you see that the depth of because it, it is a back and forth even with the machine, you know. So there is a lot of, of you in it. And uh, exactly. It's like you must know, like, for instance, you say a light like Joel Merowitz or, and that, so it's like, you got to know the artist, you got to know, you got to know the history of art. Otherwise you see that and you got to have taste because AI doesn't have taste. I mean, doesn't know. I had the pleasure of interviewing Joel a couple of years ago. And, yeah, he's uh, a friend. He's, he's an he's amazing human amazing. being. Amazing. And uh, yeah, his, his work is incredible. Yeah. Um, can, can I just come back to a point that you mentioned there about the collaborative aspect mm -hmm. here? And whether you are working with words or working with images, I think there's something that AI uh, or, or these generative AI chatbot type interfaces can bring, which in some ways maybe we've been missing. So as a, as a writer, as a journalist, in the past, I've had a very open dialogue with an editor, and that is invaluable for the creative process. However, inevitably, the way in which the industry has gone, you are writing and often editing yourself, and there is no copy editor there. And there may be, depending upon the environment in which you're working, no researcher working with you either. So you are solo. Chatbots, with generative AI tools, you have an opportunity to collaborate once again. It becomes a co-pilot to use a very helpful phrase that one big technology brand has brought to bear, but also I think it's very descriptive as well. And it's the same with visual mediums as well. You have an opportunity to create something and it might not be the final form. You look to Hollywood, you look to high-end TV, for example, you'll go through a process of pre-visualization where you are essentially creating the uh, the environment, the set, the scene that you want to see when you do get the cameras out, when you do spend a lot of money on a soundstage or, or, or on location. Again, you're able to have a dialogue, a creative dialogue with a uh, smart-ish co-pilot to help you really realize whatever your creative vision is. And I think that the way that uh, that the job of creators, certainly over the last 10 or 15 years, has become increasingly solo. So these tools create an opportunity for it to become a more collaborative type experience, which I think is very interesting. And for some people anyway, will be very helpful. So that brings us to diverse imagery. I've done a lot of kind of testing out of um, yeah creating images and the images that the the real new images are being generated from are actually not coming from a very diverse pool of images and um, that shows the world in a way 
which is not um, yeah representative maybe can you speak to the implications of biases within these technologies alessia maybe you can go first yeah we had uh, we actually had mutale nekonde which is an expert in biases and ai that came to the festival to speak about this mm-hmm. and uh, i think what you're saying it's very important and it's very relevant as you said you know this these systems now they're trying exactly they're they're putting a lot of effort into into mitigating that but you know mm-hmm. bias are are, are 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 real but even in real life so imagine this ai system that they feed on what's out there and it's going to be like bias at 100 like exponential bias you know exactly. so how do you deal with that we should all be very mindful very mindful we have a saying in technology circles again that's as old as the hills garbage in garbage out and these ais are trained upon data typically scraping stuff off the internet and if what's on the internet is biased and it is it is heavily biased not necessarily through malicious intent but just because of the types of people who post stuff who put stuff on the internet there's a certain profile there let's face mm-hmm. it therefore the ais will reflect that but it can also the algorithm in the middle of that can also be biased and we've seen very recently almost a, a reaction against that um, and one of the main technology players had recently took down its ai because people were asking questions uh, and getting back images that were historically inaccurate and some would argue too heavily biased in the opposite direction. So finding images of soldiers from the Second World War uh, for the German army who were black and Asian, which Mm -hmm. is certainly not accurate. Yeah, making it very diverse. Yeah. (laughs) Although then we must say, and again here is is, is how I love artists worldwide and how they how they use the tools to say things. There are a lot of interesting artists who are actually using an AI to make a point about that and yes, yes. to show the biases or to show like what it would have been, you know, if uh, the world was a better place, you know? Exactly, exactly. That makes it beautiful in a way. So we spoke a little bit about authenticity earlier on, but now speaking about this very specific topic we're on now, It does bring back the question to me, how does authenticity play a role? Because I kind of now am, well, not growing up, but I'm here when AI is kind of happening and uh, generative imaging is happening. But if I look at my dad, for instance, he's 72. When he sees this image of World War II with a black or Asian soldier, he's going to think it's real. I'm pretty sure. You have to think that every day these AI aesthetics are getting better. Mm. So yep. I remember the first AI images, you could tell. Yes, you know? easy. Then there was this sort of aesthetic of AI. You can say when it's mid-journey, you can say when it's Dali. You know, it's sort of like there is a bit of an aesthetic, but it's getting better and better. And, you know... Who knows, like a year from now, because this is so exponential, the growth. Maybe you too. I mean, I have to say that now, sometimes I'm tricked into mm-hmm. thinking Same. that something You're is right. real. I couldn't, so. I, I shouldn't just be blaming this, putting this on my dad. You're right. Yeah. I'm also sometimes tricked. <laughs> yes, it's true. They're becoming so, so real. But how do we then, how how do we know when an image is authentic and how should we... What role does the media have in this, for instance? So I'd like to say something and then I leave it to David, which because I I feel it's a very much his question. But uh, again, a point that we made at the symposium and I had, you know, people working as engineers and things is that at the moment there isn't a software that can really tell you. Because I feel that something that we all need to have would be something on your phone that tells you immediately when you scroll, you want to know, it tells you. So it's impossible to detect that. And for the way this David knows more than me, how fast the technology goes, it's going to be very, very impossible to detect that. What these very wise people instead are trying to do, and I'm talking about Santiago, Fred, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, 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 and a lot of universities are working towards this is to try instead to, 
uh, create a way for people that want, you know, in the metadata to say, I can show you that my image is it's not been uh, uh, modified. Exactly, that it's real. They're, they're making the content authenticity initiative, Santiago Lang. Yeah, and it's very important to be able, especially as a photojournalist, to be able to show people, I took this picture. So a couple of things here. Um, I, I have been commissioned or, or by some of the uh, broadcast shows that I work on to create deep fakes of well-known people, uh, not to fool people necessarily, but just to demonstrate how easy it is for somebody who is, you know, a bit technical, but certainly not an expert, how easy it is to create these deep fakes. And my findings were that it was incredibly easy. I need about 90 seconds to 120 seconds of somebody's voice and a, to all intents and purposes, free online tool. And I can create a a, a voice that with a little bit of work, uh, not too much though, would fool somebody. And the same with the visuals as well. And again, particularly if it's somebody well known, and often if it's a politician or a trusted TV presenter or anybody really on the internet, you're going to be able to find that footage. And then getting the lip sync right, it's becoming easier and easier and easier. Now, to the question about can technology identify this? Well, to an extent, yes, it can identify, particularly when you start looking at the waveforms for audio, some of the tools that generate the uh, generated the, the, the voice clones actually embed. It's inaudible, but you can see or, or a machine can see in the output the, the, the fingerprint of what it was that created that. And we've seen some high profile cases of that over the last uh, couple of months as, as we speak. However, and the same with, with visuals as well, there are, there are certain tells to a, to a human eye, but certainly to a machine that would be able to distinguish a lot of what is generated by an AI now to what is um, to, to what is real and has been shot on a camera. And that I should also say that camera manufacturers uh, and others involved in the workflow, particularly in news and in journalism, are also working to create secure workflows that do create fingerprints, essentially, that provides assurance end to end. That's all well and good. So technically, I would say at the moment, cast our net forward 18 or 24 months, then maybe not the case, but certainly at the moment, it is possible, I would say, to tell what is generated content. However, and this is the really, really big thing for me, it makes no difference whatsoever if the clip that somebody has created, has put words into somebody else's mouth, appears on a social media timeline. Now, the social media platform, the social media platforms are not policing this at the moment. Uh, legally, depending upon which market, which country you're in, they should be, particularly if there's a potential fraud behind the, the, the call to action on there, they have to take that down. But are they able to yet? Well, no. Are they yet? No. So irrespective of whether machines can tell whether it's real or not, if I see a trusted celebrity endorsing a cryptocurrency scam on my social media timeline, I can't tell. And the fact is that we've been so used over the last, particularly over the last four or five years, to see slightly blocky graphics, people dialing into television shows, uh, chat shows, breakfast shows through Zoom on their computer or whatever. And that slightly pixelated, slightly jarry look that plays completely into fraudsters and bad actors' hands. And it makes it easier for them to generate. And therefore, it makes it a lot easier for them to hoodwink victims, A, to click through to a fraud or more subtly, just to just to nudge opinion, which going back to the point about democratic elections this year is what I think we're also going to see an awful lot of. So with authenticity becoming uh, more important and with us, uh, yeah, with it becoming more difficult to actually know if something is real or not, we're seeing a shift kind of not back, but towards film photography and more retro forms of content creation. Um, Alessia, is that what you're seeing as well? Yeah, a lot. But that was going on even before AI. And I have to say, I embrace it and love it. You know, I see a lot of young people photographing with film, going out, you know, to do uh, projects with medium format cameras or even large format cameras, like so going around with 8x10s and 
so I, 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 I actually love that. I mean, this idea of going back to, you know, the craft of it and printing your own work. And uh, yeah, I see that a lot. But I've been seeing this for a, many years now. Yeah. One of my favourite creators on Instagram at the moment is somebody who goes to football matches with a film camera and they are filming themselves on their smartphone, I presume, or having someone film them, but with a Canon camera from the 1980s or the 1970s. You see them loading the film in and then you see the shots and you're able to compare side by side the the look, the feel of those images in comparison to one of the latest cameras that typically you would use to uh, shoot a sporting event with. And I I love that. There is not only a sense of, I guess, nostalgia in it, but you want this to be so much more than nostalgia. You want it to be current. Uh, And I certainly get that. It just provides a different feel to the images that I didn't realise perhaps that I'd been missing for the last 15 or 20 years of digital first photography. Well, you know, I've been I've been around for so many years uh, and beat 54 this year. So, yeah, I guess uh, many years. And I remember, you know, when I lived in New York in the 90s and I used to work uh, as assistant f- photographers, you know, and we would go maybe on trips, like go to Morocco and, and shoot all these films, you know, and then we were like, there was this thing, like you never knew, right? Like I was an assistant, so I, I needed to take care of the film and then traveling with the film and then getting developed and then editing. I mean, it was so, so different. I can't believe that... Everything happened so fast, if you think about it. No? Yeah, it's crazy. I remember, so I finished my um, studies in 2006. No, it's better to say I started in 2002. And when I started, Mm. I had a film camera. uh, But then actually, by the time I had my first class, they were like, guys, we're going to switch to digital. I just, everyone was baffled. How does this work? And Digital photography was just kind of in the beginning. It was already there, but not in the more professional cameras. And yeah, it made such a big difference. It was, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that I grew up in a digital area, but I sometimes am sad that I missed the whole film and print. And yeah, I would love to do a bit more of that too now. We're seeing a lot of teens, uh, younger photographers entering the market who obviously on their smartphones have incredible 40 megapixel sensors and all the rest of that. But instead, what they're doing is embracing the first wave of digital cameras from 20 or so years ago. And this is a trend that's been growing on TikTok. Of course, it does. Everything grows goes crazy on TikTok. But that aesthetic of the pretty awful flash of the color rendition of, of that, that look has become desirable. And it just goes to show that these things go in cycles. And even though, I mean, I have a 14-year-old daughter and she's using a um, 18-year-old point-and-shoot first-generation-ish digital camera, and she absolutely loves it. I look at the images (laughs) and wince a little bit because I'm so used to using a modern camera, but she absolutely loves the aesthetic of it. So yeah, I'm I'm certainly there for that. Hmm. Does print factor in this trend? Do you think there will be a return to magazines in the near future? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, well, I I mean, of course, uh, this is not the 80s and not even the 90s and not even the 2000s anymore. And uh, me being there forever, I've seen all of it, you know. I've seen since the golden age of us going to like Anguilla for a week to do a two, to do 10 pictures, you know, to now having to do like a uh, hundred in half a day. So, uh, I mean, things, uh, things have changed uh, much, but I do believe more and more like there's always these things that one say, ah, uh, uh, print is dead or uh, photography is dead. There's always someone dying and no one dies at the end. Because, it's so true. No, but also because I feel that this idea of the magazine uh, becoming an object and also the idea of the of the scarcity that there is in a magazine, you know, because it's a, it, it, it can't be of infinite pages like the internet. So it becomes more precious. And if you are in the magazine, it's more precious than... And also I feel that the magazines now have uh, 
even a stronger impact in life through social media. So like, for instance, the cover of, of a magazine it becomes like a political statement often, right? And uh, so I feel, I feel it, magazines are still relevant and, and will always be. Maybe, yes, I mean, you don't need to do the weekly, the thing, but, but you know, you make this book quality magazines with beautiful imagery, uh, with, with articles that maybe are going deeper into the things. So it's not the daily, you know, but at the, at the same time, I feel it's like photography books. It's, they've never been, uh, you know, more alive than they are now. And, you know, and everyone wants to have the photography books. And again, in this very, very, you know, ethereal uh, life that we have, where we're also very much virtual ourselves, you know, then this idea of pieces of things that you can touch, that you can, that are objects, uh, they become even more important. So I really do not think that is going to end, you know? No, no. So there was one uh, thing that I actually had totally missed, but I think both of you know, and mm. I was, my jaw just dropped to the ground when I saw the videos that were coming out of this, Sora. Maybe David, mm. you can explain what Sora is. I just, I looked through all the videos and I just, I, I'm, shocked. Sora is to video what Midjourney or Dali is to stills. It is a generative AI engine where you can type in a, a few words and out comes a short video that has uh, been created by the uh, AI and the images are, or well, the video is Jaw dropping. Totally. <laughs> it is uh, e extraordinary. And you can very, very quickly see at, at the point at which we're chatting right now, it broke cover a week or two ago and it's still very much in a in a closed state at the moment but some high profile people have been allowed to access it i mean yeah, internet celebrity mkbhd was allowed to play with it and share some of the output that he got from it and yeah it is um again on the one hand really exciting from a technological point of view. It is, wow, it's incredible. For those who are working in the creative industries, it is that X word again, it's it's existential. What does this mean for those who are for, for those whose jobs has been to painstakingly create these in VFX studios or even on set? Uh, what does it mean for their jobs? I really don't know, but this technology right now is good enough to create really interesting visuals. And with all the rest of the generative AI puzzle that we've been talking about today, it's really not too much of a hop, skip and a jump to see that TV programs, features, at least animations and, and cartoons and so on will, will be created with this before the year's out in my book. You know, there is this um, something we didn't speak about it's uh, uh, now I want to do the devil's advocate with myself, you know, but uh, <laughs> it's just, um, uh, it's for instance, the idea that, you know, to, to do a certain um, shoot, uh, you should have money, right? If you don't have someone backing you up, because maybe, and, and not everyone can, uh, can, you know, can access this money. So, the idea is also that somehow this is democratized. Demo, I help me out because I can't say the word. Demo, don't ask Demo, me. Democrats. No. Uh, Democrat. <laughs> Democratization. Oh, no, thank you, David. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Unless yeah, we oh, tried. <laughs> we tried. Sorry. Demo. Demo. Democratization. Democratization. Perfect. I love Perfecto. it. Okay, so. It's, it's democratic, whatever, the, uh, the, the entire thing. If you are an artist, like you're a young artist, you have a great idea, mm. but you don't know how to get there. And now I'm talking about the idea of mixing photography with them. And uh, yeah, I mean, but uh, is this uh, enough of a reason to just uh, let it happen? No, I don't think so. But yeah, d let's just put all the cards out there, at least all the cards that, that we know, you know. And again, I'm talking about art and I'm not talking about photojournalism, which 
it's really something else. David, you were nodding. I was agreeing. <laughs> you were agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just musing on the fact that it would be really easy with a bit of generative AI in whatever editing software is being used to uh, edit this podcast together that uh, to get Alessia to say democratization perfectly. <laughs> and she never said it in the real world, or, or uh, actually you did uh, eventually, but it'd be really easy to... No, I did not. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. But also, they could be having us saying things that we don't, don't mean, like, you know... <laughs> Me saying that I want to just use AI, you know, or, you know, they could do all sort of things. Who knows, you know, what's going to be up and who knows when we listen to this podcast online, I'm sure it's not going to be us speaking, you know. Change the whole thing. Well, maybe yeah. I can, we can ask uh, AI to answer the last question, but I think for now I'm going to ask you both to answer the last question. Then we'll see when editing, if we're going to leave your answer in or if we change the whole thing. Um, I'm curious where both of you think or predict where photography and videography and content creation will be in 25 years from now. 25 years. Okay. So if you think the way in which technology now is becoming, uh, uh, let's say, used by everyone, right? I think uh, the time between... Uh, when a technology is invented or something is invented and then when it becomes used by the majority of people, this, uh, um, let's say, gap, mm -hmm. uh, it's closing more and more and more. Yes. So let's say, I don't know, Facebook tech took 10 years, Instagram took three years, um, AI, <laughs> it's six months. Yes. Okay, so, okay yes. so 25 years, Yeah, it's really you can <laughs> you can make it 10 if you like uh, I don't I don't know I don't know I don't know I mean I think I think um okay I'll give you this this uh, this thing um I thought and many of us maybe thought that movies were dead because we had covid no one would go to the theaters then we had that series tv that are great you know And then all of a sudden, it's like if you think of all the incredible great movies that came out in the past year, there are movies done by incredible directors that are movies thought of as an experience that should be at the theater. Then this makes me think that there are always incredible minds out there, incredible souls that find uh, ways to make the heart again speak and, and become relevant. And, and be so I want to be positive and I want to have hope. I think that is a hopeful thought. And I think there will always be creative people who will be creating from their hearts. Yeah, and not exactly. I think the other thing that people are a bit fed up with, it is that When uh, you are doing something and it is obviously that you're doing that thing to gain money, to gain success, to sell something. So it is obvious that the main reason is that people are starting not to want to be engaged anymore. You know, like if you think there's been this incredible uh, fashion show by Margiela, Uh, which is designed by John Galliano, who's a total genius. Mm -hmm. And it was so poetic and so real and so incredible. And uh, it wasn't done to become like a viral thing, but it mm -hmm. did. So that brought a bit of hope because it's like it wasn't making something just to, you know. Yeah, to generate attention, money. Or yeah, it was something that it real something from the heart something real artistic and actually it is it struck a chord in everyone and uh, so maybe exactly there is still a lot of people who want uh, authenticity meaning not authenticity the adherence to reality now i'm saying but authenticity meaning uh, i'm doing this because i believe in this you know exactly. it's not that i'm doing this because i want that's Another thing that I always tell young people when they come to me or, for instance, in my career, I've always been guided by passions, mm -hmm. by a, a real belief in what I do and what I want to do and the ethics of it is not because I wanted to become successful, you know. And again, you know, I think this shows 
in, in, of in our path. And, and then it's rewarded. And the same thing should be, you want to be a photographer, you want to be a fashion photographer. But because you love the, the thing in itself, not because you want to become famous. Not for the wrong reasons. So real people, real love. Real, realness, adherence of purpose and uh, mission with, exactly, with the craft, you know? I hope these beautiful words will be true in the future, in 25 years or 10 years or whenever. I yeah. think the future with uh, all this XR is going to be here very quickly. Um, David, where do you think this all is going or maybe we're already there? Two things, I think. First of all, something that I hope for. And secondly, something I think we're already beginning to see, but maybe we haven't covered so much here. Uh, first of all, regulation. We've spoken about guardrails, controls, governance with all, with all of this uh, AI in place. And we're already starting to see that come into action. And in the European Union, we have the EU AI Act, which is, I think, very good. It seems to be getting um, good plaudits from across the world, really, uh, about how we control, about how uh, companies bring AI products to market and make sure that they don't pose an existential risk to humanity. I think that at a at a big, at a, a, a macro level like that, this is a good thing. Humanity needs it, frankly. We can't be trusted, I think. Uh, but also at a at a creative level as well, I hope that we're able to find some accord, some contract between consumers and creators that enables us to make sense of what is real, what isn't real, how we can, how we how we shouldn't trust things in in technology circles when we're talking about about trust. There's this thing called zero trust, and the mantra is never trust, always verify. And I think that uh, with our with the next generation, with my kids coming through, the sooner that we can uh, embed that in their minds that they need to verify whatever they see, whether it looks real or not, uh, is is going to be a good thing. The second thing, just to turn it around, we're talking about uh, the creation of art here, photography, photojournalism, video, and so on. But an angle that maybe we can talk about another time is how we consume that as well. And we've spoken about uh, XR, VR, uh, mixed reality, all of these different realities. And the ways in which we consume this content, whatever it is, is also changing with these things like head-mounted displays, with spatial computing. I believe that we are going to be wearing more glass, more computers on our face about our bodies. And as a medium to consume content, it connects the the viewer with the art, with the creation in a way that we haven't experienced before. There's a whole new language, a whole new set of uh, conventions when you are immersed in a video or even when you're immersed in a photograph that we we as humans are, are still getting used to and creators, it's going to be a really exciting space. For example, one of the biggest tech companies in the world recently released its head-mounted display and even still images, even panoramas, even images that were taken two or three days ago from people I know who've experienced that, they express this connection with the image when they are in the image, when they are in that in that space, when they are present there, that no other art form, even going to an IMAX cinema or something like that, they haven't experienced that before. So I think that's a really exciting, furtive, maybe dangerous space as well. But let's see for creators and indeed those of us who consume those creations to experiment with over the next few years. Thank you so much. Thank you both. I think the future is very exciting and very scary. Um, thanks for sharing so much of your knowledge uh, with all the listeners. I'm amazed of uh, what I hope is going to come in the future and what's already here. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for being here. This was really amazing. Thank you. Thank you for having us, really. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Shutter Stories, a Canon podcast. Thank you to my guests, Alessia Glaviano and David McClelland, and to you for listening. Please come back next month for another episode. And in the meantime, don't be a stranger. There are loads of brilliant ways to stay in contact with us in the show notes. We'd love to hear your feedback, so rate the show five stars on the platform you listen on and spread the word with all your favorite photographers, filmmakers, and content creators. Until next time. Shutter Stories, a Canon podcast. <laughs>